This is Panair Flight 5052. They've just been cleared for takeoff. At this point, no one is aware that the last safety barrier failed. Just a few seconds after taking off, Flight 5052 would come to a tragic end. Three years later, the final report has been published, and even today, nobody knows why the takeoff warning system failed that day. Spanner Flight 5052 was the second leg of a rotation that started in Barcelona earlier that day. The flight plan consisted of three legs, the first one towards Madrid, the second one towards Las Palmas de Gran Canaria, and finally a third one heading back to Madrid, finishing the rotation at 20 past 7 in the afternoon. The captain was 39 years old, he was an ex-military pilot who served the Spanish Air Force as a flight instructor and a test captain of the CASA 212 aircraft. He joined Spanair in 1999 to fly as a first officer in the MD-80 fleet. Almost eight years later, he was upgraded to captain and he accumulated over 8,476 flight hours, out of which 3,118 were as a captain. Among his colleagues, he was known to be a kind of pilot that asks for flaps as soon as the area around the airplane was clear during the pre-flight operations. Unfortunately, this is going to be relevant later on. The first officer was 31 years old. He held a commercial pilot license obtained in 2001. After finishing his training, he tried to find a job in various companies, but the situation in Spain was really bad, especially in the aviation industry. The job offers for pilots were really scarce at the time, and it took him six years until he eventually was hired by Spanair in 2007. His previous flight experience at that time was 220 flight hours. After joining Spanair, he took the MD Fleet Rating course and he passed the line training on the 2nd of September 2007. At the time of the accident, he had a total of 1,276 flight hours, out of which 1,054 have been on the MD-80. Unfortunately for this first officer, the situation in Spain is about to become really bad. The company was already laying off employees and he knew he was in the list. So he was actively looking for another job with the goal to keep flying and keep alive his dream. Pilots who knew him described him as a serious and disciplined pilot who was polite and who always made an effort to collaborate. Specifically, they noted how much he loved to fly and how happy he was to have a chance to do so. At the end of the day of the accident, he was planning to spend some time with his girlfriend on holidays in Palma de Mallorca. Unfortunately, this never happened. The aircraft was a McDonnell Douglas MD-82. It was built in 1993 and delivered to Korean Air on the same year. Since 1999, the airplane had been operated by Spanair with the Spanish registration Eco Charlie Hotel Foxtrot Papa. 
As of the 20th of August 2008, the aircraft had accumulated almost 32,000 flight hours and over 28,000 cycles. This model was equipped with two Pratt & Whitney turbofan engines. The reverse of engine number two had been deactivated. On the handle of the reverse thrust lever, there was a label with the word DEACT handwritten on it, and that handle was safety wired to the throttle lever, so it cannot be deployed during a landing. This aircraft was configured with 167 passenger seats, two seats for the flight crew, one jump seat in the cockpit, and four folding seats for the flight attendants. Let's review the sequence of events that led to the accident. As previously mentioned, the first leg of the rotation was the flight from Barcelona to Madrid Barajas. The crew arrived at the operator's offices in Barcelona at 8 in the morning. They had the pre-flight briefing and they took off at 8.55, arriving in Madrid at 10.13 in an uneventful flight with no abnormalities reported in the aircraft technical logbook. Upon arrival to Madrid Barajas, the crew went to the operator's office and they planned the next leg for the day towards Las Palmas de Gran Canaria that was scheduled at 1 p.m. At 13.06, the crew contacted Clearance Departure East requesting permission for startup and as soon as the engines were alive, they contacted South North Ground Control, requesting permission to taxi. The parking brakes were released at 13, 13 and 57 seconds, and the flight data recorder started to capture data. They left the stand T21, and they were taxiing towards the point Romeo 1. Once they approached this point, they contacted departure and soon they were cleared for takeoff. The crew acknowledged the ATC clearance. However, 20 seconds later, they came back to report that they had a slight problem and they need to exit the runway. The problem the crew has detected was a high reading of the ram air temperature. This is the total temperature that the aircraft is experiencing during its flight and is the sum of the static temperature plus the compressibility effects as the aircraft is moving through the air. This temperature is measured using the rat probe situated outside of the aircraft. The probe is equipped with a heating system to avoid the formation of ice during flight. However, due to a malfunction, the heater was on with the aircraft on the ground. Therefore, the pilots were able to reach temperatures up to 104 degrees Celsius. The temperature in Madrid was high, but not 104 degrees at least that day so they decided to contact the maintenance control center and ask for guidance in regards to this problem. The personnel instructed them to restart the breaker Z29 several times. This breaker is responsible for the rat probe heating system. The crew replied mentioning that they've already done this without any success, so the personnel advised them to obtain assistance from maintenance in Barajas. The flight crew contacted Spanair's ground assistance to request maintenance services and an agent contacted the headquarters in Palma de Mallorca which authorized the flight crew to replace the aircraft in case the one that they were using had to be declared aircraft on ground. The crew decided to return to parking and wait until maintenance reported the scope of the issue. At approximately 13.42, the aircraft arrived at the stand Romeo 11, a remote parking position in the T2 apron. There, two maintenance technicians approached the aircraft and after being informed by the crew about the issue, they went and performed a visual check of the rat probe. The check didn't reveal any abnormalities and they wanted to see if the heating circuit was energized 
so they used the ice protection meter selector and the heat switch. This proved that the circuit was energized, which confirmed the malfunction. Then the technicians checked the minimum equipment list, and uh, chapter 30.8 mentions that the airplane can be dispatched with the probe heating inoperative, as long as icing conditions are not forecast for the flight. They confirmed this with the shift supervisor, who also consulted the minimum equipment list, and finally the technician proposed to the captain that the airplane could be dispatched with the breaker Z29 pulled, so as to disconnect the electrical supply to the rat probe heater. The captain agreed, the technician placed an inoperative label over the rat display, and finally they made the entries in the aircraft technical logbook. Once the pre-flight maintenance inspection was completed, the aircraft was released for service, and at this time there was a sensation of rush and time pressure in the cabin. The CVR recorded the captain remarking on the significant delay, they also recorded conversations with the flight attendants saying that the temperature in the cabin was really hot. The first officer initiated a private phone call with his girlfriend saying that they're gonna have to change their plans. And to all this, there was the subconscious pressure about the situation in Spanair with all the layoffs due to the economical situation. All this created the perfect storm that was about to happen. At 14.07 and 2 seconds, the first officer requested permission from ATC to start the engines. During the before start checklist, the captain anticipated some of the items on the list before they were read by the first officer. This indicates that the crew was under a certain level of time pressure. In the after start checklist, the item to check the flaps and the slats was omitted because unfortunately at that time the captain asked the first officer to request permission to taxi towards runway 36 left and the first officer didn't come back to this item. As they were not getting the clearance and feeling the delay, the captain once more contacted the ATC requesting permission to taxi. This time ATC cleared them and instructed them to contact them back once they reached the point Romeo 5. At 14, 14 and 33 seconds the parking brakes were released and the flight data recorder captured the flaps in the retracted position. The next safety barrier is the taxi checklist. The last item is the takeoff briefing and unfortunately the captain's reply to the first officer's reading could not be heard on the CVR. This was another opportunity to check whether the flaps positions were deployed or retracted. During the taxiing towards the point Romeo 11, there were some conversations in the cockpit between the pilots and the person traveling in the jump seat who was a flight attendant. They eventually reached the point Romeo 5 and they were the next in line behind another MD-80 airliner. The CVR recorded the first officer reading the final items on the checklist, saying Final items, we have sorry 8, 11 aligned, 11 stowed. Immediately after the airliner in front of them took off, the ATC cleared them for runway 36 left and the crew acknowledged the clearance. The first officer decided to perform a manual takeoff. He advanced the throttles, released the parking brakes, and as they were rolling down the runway, the different speed callouts could be heard on the CVR. At 14, 24 and 10 seconds, the aircraft detaches from the ground and 4 seconds later, the stick shaker is activated as well as the horn and synthetic voice warning of an aerodynamic stall. Immediately after the stall, the aircraft started to bank towards the right, the first officer called an engine failure and he reduced the thrust levers, especially in the right engine, which accentuated the bank angle towards the right. 
Almost immediately, the thrust levers were moved to their maximum position, and they stayed in that position until the end of the CVR recording. The tail impacts the ground first, followed by the right wingtip, and the aircraft continued to travel along the ground for 500 meters until it reached the edge of the runway strip. The aircraft lost contact with the ground, and when it contacted the ground on the side of a hill, the aircraft lost its structural integrity and it left its outline on the ground. The main wreckage continued to travel along some irregular terrain, until it stopped near the La Vega stream. The accident claimed the lives of 148 passengers and all six crew members. Only 18 people survived. Let's rewind and understand how all the safety barriers came down that day. So let's start with the RAM air temperature. Data extracted from the flight data recorder showed that in the two previous days to the accident, there were five cases in which the rat's temperature probe was overheated on the ground. To understand why this happened, the investigation team had to find among the wreckage the Relay 25 that was responsible of activating the RAM air temperature probe heating during flight. Once the relay was found, the investigation team performed three different analyses, and in the last one, they were able to show that the contacts C2 and C3 fused together and then separated again. When these two contacts are fused, the probe heater is energized. As mentioned earlier, the two aircraft technicians decided to disconnect the Z29 breaker, which was sending power to the RAM air temperature probe heating system. The next safety barrier that came down was the takeoff warning system. This system sends warnings to the pilots when they try to take off with the aircraft not configured for takeoff. This system is also controlled by the Relay 25 and is only operative with the aircraft on the ground. The three different analyses performed on the Relay 25 were not able to prove why the takeoff warning system was inoperative during the takeoff run. Even today, this is still a mystery. Between 2000 and 2008, Boeing reported that they were aware of 13 cases where the takeoff warning system failed during the pre flight checks. All these cases were solved by replacing the Relay 25. We'll never know for sure, but it all points out that the Relay 25 was responsible for the takeoff warning system being inoperative that day. The next safety barrier to calm down was the checklist. Back in the 80s, two similar accidents happened in the United States. The first one happened in 1987, when the crew crashed in Detroit after they attempted to take off without deploying the flaps and slats. Approximately one year later, the Delta Airlines 727 took off without flaps or slats from Dallas following the improper performance of the taxi checklist. In the case of Spanner Flight 5052, the crew missed in three different checklists the position of the flaps and slats. During the last checklist, the takeoff imminent, the first officer was heard in the CVR reading back the final items. However, the crew never checked the position of those items. Additional to all this was the misinterpretation of an engine failure, 
which increased the bank angle, worsening the stall and making the crash inevitable. This accident was close to never happening and when you read the final report it's really frustrating to see how all the safety barriers came down one after another. 